if we are ready to go, we are going to bring up our first group of panelists. It's our digital ag panelists, and they are going to be coming up and taking a seat on the stage. Our panel moderator coming to the podium is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Crop Sciences, and her research focuses on system scale modeling of agricultural systems to help increase margins for farmers. And as a farmer's daughter, I think we all can recognize that if margins will be impacted in the positive way, they'll be much more likely to adapt the technologies. Leading the discussion on navigating digital ag is Elhan Erzos. Thank you for being over here early in the morning on a rainy day. So with us today, our panelists are Justin McManamy, the VP of Disruptive Product Precision Planting, Dave Kippenberg, Director of the Data Platforms from Milanco. Jared Fry, Director of Modeling and Simulation from Mondelez. And Dominic Walkis, Director of the Tech Product Management at TNHI. So today we would like to talk about digital ag. Um, my first question to our panel today is about the, the digital agriculture domain. Um, I, I personally tend to imagine the digital lag as a Swiss Army knife with a suite of tools with different purposes for each of the different technologies, um, like variable rate technologies, data-driven management, um, FMIS, market connectivity, robotics. They all address different challenges in digital agriculture. Would you please tell us a little bit about your and your organization's focus and your digital agriculture value proposal. Can we start from the beginning? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Knippenberg. I lead data platforms at Alenco. Um, I've been in the tech space for about 18 years. Uh, 12 of that has been in the pharmaceutical industry, both human and animal. Alenco um, creates products and services to prevent and treat disease in farm animals and pets. Our team uh, provides data uh, engineering capabilities and machine learning capabilities to the organization. Um, we also manage, uh, maintain, and expand um, data products which are used across all functions. Um, in terms of value proposition, you know, as I can, uh, you can tell from the introduction, um, we're more of an internally focused team. You know, we are here to enable uh, the rest of the organization to be faster, to make better decisions. So that means, you know, help researchers comb through millions of papers, you know, whether it's from uh, content that we generate or from acquisitions, you know, get through that content faster, you know, find things that are relevant uh, to their research. Maybe that means um, we help uh, with um, like AI vision, you know, to look through research video data, you know, to, to test the efficacy of products that we're creating, you know, do that faster. Um, maybe it means we're helping the, the sales team uh, make decisions about which products might be most appropriate, you know, for our, our farms and our customers. Um, so really, that's, that's the name of the game for us, is helping the organization and our stakeholders uh, be faster and make better decisions. Hey, good morning. I'm Dominic Walkus. Uh, I've worked with CNH for about 12 years uh, and been in the product development space for about 20. Uh, as it relates to uh, CNH products and, and solutions, we really have had two prominent machinery brands, Case and New Holland. Um, and so what digital agriculture means to us is really uh, the enabling capabilities to make those machines and, and pieces of equipment more efficient. You talked about a Swiss Army knife, and I thought that was a, a really great analogy. Uh, CNH manufactures tractors and spreaders and sprayers and combines. Um, but digital agriculture is kind of that Swiss Army knife that connects all those different tools together into a comprehensive package. And so we see the, the capability of digital ag as really bringing uh, the disparate functions together. 
My name is Justin McMenemy. I work at Precision Planting. I've uh, been at Precision Planting for about 10 years and in product development for about 20. Uh, precision Planting is, is very active and very uh, focused on bringing precision agriculture technologies to the marketplace and in particular how to most efficiently and effectively place the input, whether it's fertilizer, whether it's seed, whether it's a herbicide, because really the return on investment is, is not just the chemistry inside of the, or the traits inside of the input, but it's how it's placed in the field and how it's cared for once it's placed in the field. So with, with our focus really being in precision agriculture, for us, digital agriculture is about, exp is, is about showing the effects, about showing the, the control, about showing how that precision agriculture is being applied. So, so as we think about digital agriculture, it's very much focused on a number of horizons in which the grower is going to use that information. The first horizon is in the cap, in that precious hour where hundreds of thousands of dollars are being applied, and they want to be applied accurately. They want to be applied in the, in the best possible way. And so our, our focus in digital agriculture there is to present lots and lots of information in a very intuitive and insightful way so that the grower can make the second by to second decision to continue his operation or to stop his operation and fix, fix the situation. We then look at the next horizon, which is outside of the cab, but inside of the season, where the grower now wants to see what was the efficacy or what was the, the efficiency of the last pass and whether or not he's gonna make another pass. For, for a grower in the sprayer, in the season with the sprayer, it's not predetermined how many applications he's gonna put. The weather really determines and, and the, the, the crop health really determines how many passes they're going to go through in a given year. And so we want to use digital agriculture to give him as much information at his fingertips to make those decisions. And then finally, to have all of that information from across the operation in a single place so that for each of the 40 crops that they get to put into the ground across their career, they're able to improve their practice based off of the lessons learned this year. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jared Fry, I'm with Mondelez. Uh, Mondelez is a snacking company, so we make brands like Oreo and Cadbury, chocolates and cookies around the world. Um, I lead our modeling and simulation team, so we use digital to answer all kinds of questions that we would face in R&D. So things like, what are consumers gonna like, and how will the fluids flow through these pipes in the, in the plants? Um, will this product survive transit, getting out to consumers? Um, though digital agriculture has become a large focus within my team as well, uh, very much more at down, or downstream from the, the folks on the, the land making and, and growing the crops. Um, but from our perspective, the, I would say the value proposition really centers around uh, two things. So one I would say is just remotely monitoring all the, the entire planet and how things are growing. So it allows us to make better decisions. So we can uh, use the technologies to better predict early detections of pests and disease or um, where crops might be thriving or where crops might be struggling. Um, and it just allows us to get ahead of those things uh, more quickly. Um, and then on the other side, I would say a large part of, uh, of digital agriculture is improving crop yields, which is a centerpiece in our net zero roadmaps. Um, especially on the agriculture side, just improving yields have a lower impact per unit that's being created. So um, those are probably the two main fronts, I would say, on our value proposition. That all is a very diverse and great set of applications for digital agriculture, I'll say. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the challenges that the digital agriculture faces today. Um, one, of the, one of the complaints at the field right now is that the adoption has been very gradual considering, you know, the yield monitor, which is the earliest technology that we can count as digital agriculture has been out there since 1995. So what would you say that these challenges are? Why is the adoption being slow in going? Shall we start with Jared this time? Sure. Uh, you know, f from our perspective, we buy like I said, crops from all over the globe. I would say our three main crops are wheat, sugar, and cocoa. 
and each present different challenges. Um, so one of the challenges around cocoa is that the majority of the industry, majority of the crops, all the chocolate that you're all buying is primarily grown in one region in West Africa. A lot of smallholder farmers, they don't have these big plots of land, you know, big equipment and machinery. They don't have access to the, the technology. They're not flying drones around to monitor their lands. Um, small family-owned farms. So getting the data needed to make those informed models is always going to be a challenge. Um, and then on the flip side, how do you deploy it out? So Mondelez owns, uh, we operate um, kind of a test a research, agricultural research tech center, uh, which is based in Indonesia. And we can test things and prove things out on our test plots of land, in our very controlled agricultural environments, but then how do you deploy that out to the end users, to the end farmers that are going to be using it? Um, so deployment and just access to that data globally. You know, if I, need, if I need to know what's happening in wheat fields in France, and then the next day I need to know something about sugar fields in Brazil, how do I get all that information? Um, and just digitally connect it all so that we can make decisions about it. That, that, that actually ties in with all of the internet, edge computing, and technologies. Are you using any of those in your applications? We do. Uh, we are more downstream, so we don't own the farms. We're not. We, are, we don't employ the farmers, so we will generally work through brokers or through different consortium that we create. Um, so we don't have full control over what we plant in the ground or what you know what devices we're using to collect data. Um, but we we try to through different consortiums around growing wheat and growing cocoa, especially. Uh, try to create these communities where we can share best practices and um, share kind of you know what you know, what some of the newer technologies are, or some of the the simpler to adopt technologies. Um, there's also a big risk factor too. Let's not forget about that too. Sorry, I don't want to have no, the mic over wonderful. here. I'd love to talk a little bit more about that if we have time left at the end. Shall we? To boil down 10 years of uh, conversations about digital agriculture into three minutes, that's, a, that's quite a challenge. Uh, you know, in, in some level, you, you mentioned the yield monitor. You know, the yield monitor is one of the fastest adopted precision agriculture technologies in history, and it took 20 years. It took 20 years from the first retrofit yield monitors before we got to 90, 95% adoption. And so if we think about digital agriculture, really the shotgun start, in my opinion, to digital agriculture, at least in the realm that, that I work in, the row crop space, was the, the unicorn acquisition of the Climate Corporation by, by Monsanto in 2012. So at some level, we're, we're really only 10 years into, uh, 10, 12 years into what could be a 20 year adoption curve. But I, I do think you, you highlight there are, uh, there are hindrances, there are, there are things that have not met expectations, and, and there's a lot of different conversations around what has caused those. One of them that I have had a fair bit of exposure to is really, I would even say that the business models that have been attempted in, in digital agriculture with, with, I've sat in on a lot of panels, I've sat in on a lot of pitch decks, you know, there's, there's dozens of CEOs across the industry over the last 10 years that have either gone to investors or gone to customers or gone to, to shareholders and said that digital agriculture and row crop is a, a billion dollar industry. You know, it's, a, it's a billion dollar industry and the reality is, is if, you, if you do just some, I'm a simple guy, I'm not from Illinois, so I'm, I'm from Missouri, so you can make all the Missouri jokes that you want to make. <laughs> but uh, in Missouri we just do simple math. Uh, so there, there's a hundred thousand customers 100,000 customers in the entire United States in the row crop industry. So think about the size of Bloomington Normal and consider the entire industry is probably about the size or a little, a little bit smaller than, than the city of Bloomington Normal. So if it's a billion dollar industry in row crops for digital agriculture, that means that you need to have 100% market penetration at a $10,000 price point every year. And so just the, the, the math of it being a billion dollar industry is, is, is very difficult uh, from that perspective. I, th I think the other parts that, that boil into it is uh, they've approached it 
from the sense that the grower is going to be the one to pay for it. And then there's been a hundred different models in that sense. And the grower doesn't spend $10,000 on a subscription for very many things. The input would be an example that they, that they need to subscribe to each and every year. And, and, and there's been a, just a lot of approach of bringing what I would say business models out of Silicon Valley or business models out of other software industries and bringing them in. You know, one that was very popular to try uh, for a lot of years is kind of the Google model, which is to say, let, let's take this information, let's, uh, let's either present it back to the grower or let's use that information for an advertising uh, purpose. And, and the reality is there's a couple things that are missed there. Number one, you know, when I clicked last night on Google and I searched for a Serta Perfect Sleeper, my back's been hurting a little bit, so I, I went and looked for a, uh, a mattress. I would love for Google to send me a coupon for $200 off my Serta Perfect Sleeper. Right, because that'd be, that'd be great. But the, the, the data in agriculture is more akin to your medical information and your financial information bundled together. And so there's the, 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 the concern of the industry, the concern of the customer to have their data, their, their farm data shared, not just with suppliers, not just with potential customers, but, but with, 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 uh, with other people, is to share their medical information and their financial information all at once. And so, so I would say, you know, among other reasons, I think honestly, part of it has been that w there's been business models that have been tried to be brought from outside the industry into the industry without understanding the nuance of the industry. And it's set very high expectations for shareholders. It's set very high expectations for investors. And they've set very high expectations for customers. And in many ways, they've disappointed over and over again. And so I think there is an aspect in which digital agriculture is actually a little bit in the hype trough right now where, where some of the businesses kind of have to retool and say, okay, what exactly are we trying to do, do here? What exactly is the customer willing to pay for? So long answer, I apologize for No, that way. was a wonderful answer. And I'll throw in this little tidbit of information out there. The 2022 Ag Census just came out a couple of weeks ago and, and looking through it, one statistic stands out about 90% of the farm households in the United States are small farms. And only about 10% is large industrial production farms. So the budget that any of those small farmers would have for technology would be significantly different in comparison to what else you can do with that. So maybe the market estimates needs to be adjusted a little, what would you say? Absolutely. No, I, I think that, that has been the, the problem is expectations and, and business model approach and not, not knowing and understanding the customer psychologically, financially, historically, and what truly they are looking for in, in digital agriculture. Wonderful, thank you. Next one. Uh, thanks. I, I really uh, appreciate your simple math and, and generally agree with uh, your assessment. So you covered a bunch of uh, points that I had, maybe a couple of things that uh, that I would mention. If I look across uh, product and, and uh, our industry in general over the last decade, uh, there are examples where there's high value solutions uh, with a clear ROI that get adopted very quickly. The challenge comes in with those fuzzier items. Either there's uh, really high value, but it's hard to draw a direct correlation, or uh, maybe the value is it's really easy to use, but maybe the value uh, proposition isn't clear. And so I think um, you know, some of that is just weeding out uh, the things that, that maybe don't have the scale or applicability uh, across the diverse uh, nature of, of farms. Uh, maybe the second piece and the biggest opportunity that I see is given the, the kind of rise of a lot of different business models, a lot of different solutions, there's a real opportunity to uh, take the fragmented ecosystem that exists today uh, and radically simplify it uh, while delivering value. I think that's where the, um, the true solutions will uh, arise out of the next decade, is uh, through the ashes, so to speak, um, digital solutions that truly deliver on the promise of uh, making it easier for farmers to get value through uh, technology and their operation. Yeah, I mean, the return of investment has been quoted in one of these surveys that I actually 
read about as the number one reasoning why farmers are hesitating to actually adopt technology. What we recommend, I mean, what can we do to demonstrate the return on investment? Yeah, I think it depends on uh, your business and where you're focused. At c &H, uh, we make machines, and so our focus is on how do we make those machines uh, and the farmer's operation run more smoothly and efficiently. So if you think of it from, through a sustainability lens, there are inputs like fuel uh, that go into all of our machines in order to achieve an operation. How can we make the fuel that's consumed in that machine the most efficient possible and the direct correlation to an output? So how do we eliminate idle time? How do we make uh, trips through a field uh, as efficient as possible? How do we coordinate uh, machines in a way that uh, maybe your combine isn't sitting there waiting for uh, an unload because the, the tender driver wasn't uh, uh, on the same page? Those are all opportunities, I think, where digital tools can really help uh, streamline operations. Thank you. Let's hear from our last speaker that we can have a little bit of a conversation about this. I'm hearing some stirring among our speakers here. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So, you know, I have a, an interesting perspective because we, we are really internally focused, but because it's data, we get pulled in to external conversations. You know, and one of the things we run into a lot is, you know, especially because we're talking about pharmaceuticals, you know, who do we have to partner with? you know, to make sure that we deeply understand the problems in the space. And a lot of the times that is, you know, the farmers. So we send people out to the farms to work with them, you know, observe how they use our products, you know, what do they need to be effective. Um, and observations that come back are things like, you know, I don't have great connectivity, you know, in this area, so I'm gonna take notes by hand, and then I will then, you know, upload that into our, our service portal to make sure dosing is correct and et cetera. Um, you know, so how do you kind of cross those last mile challenges, and how do we make it easier, you know, to make sure that folks feel like they're getting value? So to, to deal with those sort of external challenges, right, we create a lot of relationships. We have relationships with vets, um, both large animal and small animal. You know, we partner directly with farmers, and we have a lot of, of time and people invested in creating services to make, you know, consumption of, of the right products easier, right? So we've got a high level of engagement. Um, internally, we really adopt the same approach. It's, it's funny, you know, we talk so much about digital and tech and that's my whole job is data, but at the end of the day, solving problems just requires talking to people that have the problems and listening to what they have to say, not immediately jumping into, well, here's the solution, you know, I think you need. No, it's, it's really just listening to why is something painful? You know, how big of a problem is it really? You know, what is the impact to you? And not making a determination on what the solution is or what tech mandate would be best. Then taking that feedback, you know, sharing that feedback, you know, with a lot of different people, whether it's, you know, maybe it is sales decisions, maybe it's more process decisions, maybe it's research decisions, um, and kind of democratizing that feedback, and then starting to iterate on solutions, then putting that in front of people, and not trying to sell folks on, okay, this is, this is the tech that's gonna fix your issue, but just quietly observing how people interact with that solution, and then taking that feedback to iterate, you know, over time. Um, so it's, it's still a long process though, especially for data. You know, people, I think, I think I frequently encounter folks who think, well, this data solution, you know, all we need is this data and this data and this data, stitch it together and then you're done. And then magic happens, right? I'll know exactly what to do in this sort of a scenario and it'll be fixed forever. But, you know, it takes a really long time and it's really complicated to actually build those sorts of solutions. So internally, you know, it's even more important to have those conversations up front so that when it is time to actually build something, we can do that quickly. You know, it's built to address the actual needs that have been um, named by our stakeholders and that we don't, you know, go too far down a road um, building something that ultimately may, might be cool, but it's not useful and doesn't provide value. Thank you very much for that. Justin, you look like you have something to say about this. Yeah, I think a big part of the return on investment is, is really what is the, uh, the price and what was the aspiration of the company that was providing the product. And, and I think a lot of companies have tried to, uh, this happens in a lot of markets where an emerging technology happens 
and oftentimes the incumbent companies view it as an opportunity to stretch their profit margins. And so they, they look and say, hey, I can, we see this in the, elect, in the automotive industry right now, right? The, the electric car wave was an opportunity for all of the incumbent industries to stretch their profit margins. Well, the customer on the other end, now there's cost of technology and there's cost of coming on board and there's things like that, but uh, essentially there was a lot of focus in digital agriculture early on to actually do like the, the the, the agronomic analytics, like actually model your yield and, and those kind of things. And, and in, in doing so, they, they said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna grab onto the cost of your agronomist and we're gonna grab onto these costs. And it essentially, they, they in many ways, under delivered on that promise, but the price was so high. So the return on investment has both the return as well as the investment side. And I think kind of the expectations, back to my previous point, the expectations on the investment that a grower is willing to pay for digital agriculture is, is also been as much as the problem as the return of the features that, that are there. Thank you for that. I, being an educator myself over here at the university, I'm going to also bring up that aspect of it. Um, the, the second most commonly cited reason for technology adoption delays was not understanding how they are going to be able to use that, the lack of educational services. Does any of your companies provide educational services together with your products? I don't know if it's a lack of educational services on how to use the tools. I think it's just, in, in, from our perspective, and we, like I said, we buy a lot of commodity crops. The cost is just an insurmountable wall for many out there. So I don't think it's like a, yeah, I, I have this tool, I just don't know how to use it, and I can't take advantage of it. It's like, oh, what are you talking about? Flying drones and like hover cars and you know, <laughs> spaceships flying around? Like, yeah, we're not, we're not at that point yet. So I, I, I don't know if, I think, and I think there's a big risk element. There's the return, there's the investment, there's the return, but there's the, the uncertainty aspect of it too. Um, and try to go to a farmer and you give them a tool that's going to predict the expertise that the farmer has themselves, they might not see the immediate value in that. And there might be a, a, a lot of uncertainty in what is going to spit out, what's going to get spit out from this model. So, yeah, I, I don't know, from my perspective, I don't know if it's necessarily an education thing, but. And I would take a little bit maybe, as a product developer myself, I would take a little bit more of an extreme ownership position on that, which says, you look at a product, you know, the iPod, the iPad, for instance, Steve Jobs, there was no education required to use it, right? Um, my my six-month-old knows how to use, not six months, that's pretty young, but my, my two-year-old knows how to use <laughs> an iPod, an iPad, but uh, my 85-year-old grandmother, she's never turned a computer on, but she also knows how to use an iPad. And, she knows if something goes wrong, what do you do? You push that button, that's the one thing. And so I would say, yes, there, there is an educational barrier uh, in some of these tools, but I would almost put the onus more on the company, the, the product developer, to say, develop a product that doesn't require, you know, if, if the value is intuitive, the customer will find it. Yeah, uh, maybe the one thing I'd add on top of that is, uh, if you put yourself in the customer or the farmer shoes and look outward, there's all kinds of providers and solutions that offer a small sliver of their total solution or uh, what they have to do in their operation. And so by broadening uh, the sphere of what you can cover, I think you can simplify their operation and not just give the farmer another tool and another fragmented uh, solution that they somehow have to figure out how to stitch together in their operation to make it work. Uh, that's where the opportunity lies. Yep. Yeah, I might have a slightly contrary opinion here. Um, you know, maybe it's just the nature of what we build, but some things, some of the things that we do have product-wise, whether they're inter internal or external, they are complicated. Um, that's not to say that they can't be made better, that they can't be streamlined. Uh, you know, that is important and we should focus on that. But at least today, we do invest, um, and I, I mentioned it earlier, right, in relationships. You know, there is a reason why we send people to farms, you know, to, to really deeply understand the challenges that they go through. 
Um, and yes, maybe that does create a feedback loop that helps us make things easier to consume and use. Um, but we do that internally too, right? We have communities of practice for data um, to try to improve, you know, what is the fluency, you know, with which our company interacts with data? How do they understand common data tools? You know, how do they understand the limitations of data solutions and data products? You know, what is this really telling you and what can it not tell you about the decisions you're trying to make? Um, and that does come back to, to having solid relationships and being able to make sure that folks can, can learn and understand, you know, from the expertise of the folks um, building those products and solutions. Thank you for that. Um, I have one more question. Eric brought up a really interesting point. We're not there yet. There are no hovercars and robots helping us out at the farm. I would love to hear a little bit about what your visions for the future of digital agriculture is going to be and what are we to expect in a farm 50 to 100 years from now? What would you say? Shall we start with you, Dominic? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, 50 years from now uh, is a long time and I think it's helpful to maybe look in the rearview mirror and think about uh, what farming was like 50 years ago, right? And if you look at the, the change in um, over that five decades and then, and then project it forward, uh, I think there was a radical amount of change that happened over that. Um, and I think there's the same opportunity uh, for a radical change moving forward. Uh, over the last 50 years, it was really the mechanization and optimization of those machines. Uh, and for me uh, to sit up here and, and say, I think that uh, technology and, and the digital tools offer the same opportunity for the next 50 years uh, that mechanization did uh, for the past 50 years. And so that's what, that's what gets me excited uh, about working in this space and the opportunity to really influence uh, farmers and our, our customers' lives every day. This is an interesting question. Um, you know, I think internally we, we talk a lot about what are the outcomes and the impact that we want to affect, you know, not just the inputs and the outputs, you know, but, but what is the vision that we're driving toward? And I think Dan mentioned this uh, in his initial talk um, when he mentioned, you know, food insecurity is a real problem globally. You know, and yes, Alanco's kind of core mission and what we do a lot, it has to do with pharmaceuticals. Um, but food security is, is one of our core pillars as well, you know, across many species. And, um, and I think over the next 50 years, you know, I'd love to see uh, sort of the, the, a technical revolution that maybe enables us to like really address some of those challenges in like a very permanent and sustainable way. You know, maybe that means that we can democratize, you know, technologies that allow us to create more effective medicines, you know, to, uh, for, our, for our livestock. Maybe it even enables us to take totally new directions where, you know, we're, we're not so dependent on um, livestock at all, you know, alternative proteins, you know, but those are big questions for how does that affect, you know, our growers and producers and how do we do that in a way, um, you know, that, that ensures that there's opportunity for everyone to, to derive value from that. Gary? I think you see a lot of these very futuristic visions of, you know, robots picking apples and, you know, no humans on a farm and everything. And I, while that is entirely possible to build, I think it goes back to a comment that's been made on the panel a lot, is what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Um, could be cool, could be fun to do, but are we solving a problem? So I think the, you know, probably what to me feels more real, um, oh, I, you also mentioned the, the hype cycle, which is something that I had jotted down in my notes preparing for this, was you know, you've got the, the peak of dissolution, no, what is it, the peak of en enlightenment and then the trough of disillusionment and then somehow you come out in the end somewhere through the middle in a, in a more realistic vision. And I think where is that more realistic vision is, is as technology just becomes cheaper and easier, as sensors become trivially inexpensive, um, you know, as the globe sits on one giant Wi-Fi network or something like that. You, you might get to that point where, um, you know, these sensors that can just sit in the soil or, you know, satellites that are monitoring thermal maps and, and temperatures and rainfalls all over the globe, that could become so accessible to farmers that it makes their jobs and their decisions so much easier. So I, 
I think it may be a, a, a sense of how they're making their decisions, what information they're using to make their decisions, uh, becoming much more simple and much more virtual um, than they are today. But yeah, I'm, in, unless, unless there is a giant problem out there that we really need robots to pick apples, I don't know if that's where we'll end up, um, but it could just be a, a much faster and much more sophisticated way of doing what we, you know, how farming and agriculture happens today. Let's hear from you, and then I have a few things to say about this as well. Thank yeah. you. So I, I, I too, have to make some. I got my mic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't drop the mic. Don't drop it. All right. Um, I, I too have seen the the pitch decks, and I've seen the, the vision of flying robots picking apples and, and things like that. I actually saw one in which uh, the farmer, it was a cartoon, he was at Disney World, because the kid next to him had the little ears on, and he had an iPad, and he was watching a robot on his farm plant his crop. And I instantly thought, this person has never met a farmer. <laughs> Because not only one, every farmer I've ever met would hate being at Disneyland because of the cost, because of the people, and because of the annoyance of it, but he would never be away from his farm when the crop is growing in the ground. And it's not just strictly a financial decision. It's not strictly an overseeing their investment decision. It is truly a passion. They, 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 most growers, most farmers could make more money with a lot less stress in another career. I, I was doing a little bit of research and I and actually came across an AARP article. So I'm, I'm not as old as I look and I don't regularly search AARP, but on the AARP website it actually said agriculture has the highest average age of all industries. 56 years old is the average age of the farmer in North America. Among all industries, these careers also offer the highest levels of happiness and meaning. The average age of the grower is 56, not because he can't retire, right? The, the moment a grower retires and he sells his equipment, he becomes a multimillionaire. It's the wealthiest day of his life is the day that he retires. He is farming because he loves it, because it's in his blood, because it's what his grandfather did and it's what his grandson hopes he hopes to do. And in my experience, absolutely, there's a, there's, a, there's a labor shortage that needs to be helped, but as many as the labor shortage, there are two and three generations stacked up waiting for grandpa to give them the planter cab. And, and it is to say, as I think about technology, and I think about autonomy, and I think about digital agriculture, my compass is the same compass that I use to automate things in my own life. The compass that I use in my own life is when 90% efficiency is good enough and I hate doing it. That's when I automate things in my life, right? So I have an automatic dishwasher, and when I get done, there's still a Cheerio stuck to the, to the bowl. And what do I do? I flick the Cheerio into the sink and I put the bowl in the cupboard. 90% is good enough and I hate doing the dishes, right? But I wouldn't automate tucking my kids into bed because I love doing it. Because it's, it's, it's who I am, it's, it's who I wanna be. And we gotta be very careful as we just mindlessly apply, I'm not at pointing fingers, I'm just saying as a, as a broad industry, we can't just mindlessly apply digital agriculture, precision agriculture, without the understanding that the person on the other end loves what they're doing and 99% accuracy sometimes is not good enough. Thank you for bringing that up. That was one of the points that I wanted to make. Farmers do farming because they love farming. It's in their blood. And, and efficiencies are great, but it is not necessarily for the time. They would like to be efficient with the inputs and the outputs and being able to do this in a sustainable way but not necessarily like spend less time out there working out there on their farm. I completely agree with that observation. The other thing that I wanted to bring up was one thing that started to come up as a big societal problem these days is the, the distance between the urban and the rural and how different 
these two cultures and lifestyles are becoming. And, and we would like to encourage that to be more unified and, and closer to each other. They would require us to bring the farms closer to the cities or cities closer to the farms. What would your take on that would be? Is that an achievable objective? Can we actually close that divide? I'll take anybody who is willing to speak about this. We have only a few minutes left. You know, I, I think I think Elanco is in a, a really interesting position where if you guys come to Indiana, you'll find that our headquarters is embedded in the middle of a very large area of farmland. And we have access, you know, to those customers. There's a reason, you know, why we did that. Um, and and even though, you know, we're we are moving our headquarters you know, Indiana is still predominantly agriculture, you know, so even when we move to Indianapolis, you know, five miles away, you know, it is very easy to get to your constituents and your stakeholders. And so maintaining that relationship, I think, is definitely achievable, and it's definitely very important. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd maybe just add, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that in North America. If I look at uh, Europe, their model and their approach, I think, is a little more uh, distributed and, and uh, tailors to that uh, that type of approach. But I think it, uh, outreach and education are going to be really critical over the next few decades to make sure we don't lose that connection uh, for people in their urban area to understand how their food is produced, where it comes from. Uh, and there's some trends that are that are coming in the market that I think will be helpful. But I think we all have a, a responsibility to make sure that people don't lose that connection because uh, it's really important uh, for our long-term success, I think. Thank you, everybody. We're going to take, take a question here. Uh, so you have a QR code on your tables if you want to submit a question digitally. We do have a couple of mics in the room as well, but I'm going to, and if you want to raise your hand and us, we can bring you a mic as well, but I'm going to hand, the first question is from Lori at Elemental Cognition. Is sale direct to consumers the only model? For instance, do you provide farmers with technology at no direct cost, but in exchange for a sale deal based on your belief that the technology will improve crop quality and yield? Is this a profitable approach? Do you want to start with this one? We have, we have multiple channels, right? So we do sell uh, direct to consumer. Um, we also work through intermediaries. You know, we have a very healthy relationship with vets as well. Um, and we have, you know, pretty typical incentive programs depending on what the right mix of products and services is. So we definitely approach it from um, multiple paths. Uh, but, but at the core of it, it's relationships with the people that use the products is most important. I'd build on the same core. We have to have uh, relationships. And those relationships today are, are held uh, through our dealer network at uh, CNH, through our Case IH or New Holland brands. Um, and so I see that uh, continuing to proliferate for us. Very similar. I, I, th I think one of the things that has been attempted multiple times over the last decade, particularly in digital agriculture, is essentially to disrupt the trusted advisor. And, and to replace the trusted advisor. And within, within agriculture, especially in our, in our domain of agriculture, uh, I think someone is gonna be much more successful by equipping and enabling the trusted advisor. And you see that in the medical profession, right? You develop a medical device, you don't put it at the mall with a $20 credit card swipe and say, hey, scan yourself and see if you have cancer. <laughs> you equip the trusted advisor, you equip the medical community to use that tool to improve the outcomes. And so I think it's gonna be a very similar arc. That's a great analogy. I don't know if my answer is gonna be as relevant because when the question came up direct to consumer, my mind was the consumers of our products. So I have to flip my, <laughs> flip my mind a little bit. Cause I was like, are we just gonna give away Oreos to people and not charge them for it? I was like, I'll take I'll, some. I'll pitch it to the big guy. We'll see how it goes. You know, no promises. Um, uh, but, I, you know, since my consumers are not the, the farmers, I, I did say that we have some consortium that we, um, that we uh, focus on, consortiums of farmers in cocoa and wheat, and some of our main crops. Um, and we, we do try to, we do offer, you know, we will fund 
fertilizers or different um, things to help them um, in, in what they're doing and growing their crops. Uh, I think as it comes to technology, as I mentioned earlier, data and infrastructure is a challenging one. Um, we don't own the farms. They're not exclusive to us. We might buy sugar from the same farm that is selling sugar to Nestle or to Hershey or something like that. Um, so it, it, the, the infrastructure and data security becomes somewhat of an issue for us, but like I said, my answer might not be as relevant because my consumers are eating the products, not necessarily growing them. We have questions here. Hi there, my name's Kelly Melton. I'm from uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm a data scientist who works with the commercialization of climate and weather data. I'm actually working on a strawberry project right now for a national grocer. They want to know um, how they can use data science to increase their freshness of strawberries. Personally, I believe that uh, there's uh, somewhat of a, a factor that lies in the labor and the farm management of this just as much as it is the, uh, the weather. My boss disagrees. Do you guys have a, an opinion on that? Who would like to take this one? I can comment briefly. We, we look at the approach, we call it G by E by M, so that's the genotype of what's being planted by the environmental factors, by the management, and it's kind of a, a three-pronged approach um, that all of them have the influence in improving yields or quality of the, the crop. Um, so, I mean, agree completely, it's not entirely just a weather thing. There's also the, the management, but that's influenced by the weather, and both of those things are influenced by the genotype uh, of the, the crop that you're growing. So I think it's definitely the three need to be considered in, in tandem. Anyone else? We have another question over here. First off, just thank you guys for being here. It's been a, a great to get your insights. Uh, my name is Eric Barnard. I'm a co-founder. That's, that's, all right. that's better, thank you. Yeah, My name's Eric Barnard. I'm a co-founder with a company called Harvest IQ. So I've been working in the, the product development space with row crop and livestock producers for uh, 10 years, part of our family farm, growing corn and soy back home. So, um, you know, I, I love what Justin, what you were saying about the, the, the target population, if you're building tools for all these row crop or livestock farms, is actually not millions of users out there. Uh, I think you guys might have some actually unique insights or tips on like how, how do we build uh, technical products for these users when a lot of times we may have an iteration cycle that's once a year. How do we get more creative? Because I do think it fundamentally is we have to hit a quality level that's just insane compared to a lot of consumer products and we may only have one shot a year to try to test that so I, I think that's one of the uh, fun problems uh, in this space is the uh, the iterative cycles you talked about how you know most customers have 40 chances of doing something in their life and I uh, you know I go to my uh, job 365 days out of the year or whatever right um, most of us don't have that same cycle or, or long pattern uh, and so I think the challenge is always how do you harvest as much information about how your product is performing and what improvements the cu uh, customer is needing uh, in a very short amount of time and then kind of retool and reload um, for the next opportunity so that you're ready. Um, there's all sorts of uh, tactics and approaches you can take um, from a global uh, perspective trying to use uh, uh, the other southern hemisphere and, and northern hemisphere uh, to your advantage. Uh, and even within the, the U.S., you know, starting down in Texas uh, very early in the year and then ending um, towards the north. So we, we do all those things to try to maximize our opportunity to, uh, to get that customer feedback. We are running out of time, so I'll take this last question. Vikram? Thank you. Thanks, Elhan. Um, my name is Vikram Ardve. I'm from the Center for Digital Agriculture at the University of Illinois. So in, in CDA, we have been developing education programs focused on digital agriculture. And my question to you all is about education. What kinds of areas, technical areas, or other areas do you see as the most important 
in terms of uh, needing more education for workforce development, both within your individual companies and, and more broadly in, in the ag industry as a whole? I think when I reflect on our, our internship programs, so we source interns um, primarily in the United States and the UK, so that's London and around um, the Indianapolis and, and U of I and Purdue area. And you know, when we, we have those programs, I think what's most important from an educational perspective is at that age at least, is, is not necessarily incredibly specific domain knowledge, but more of an attitude and an approach to analytical thinking and problem solving, as well as communication. You know, like, so we try in our intern programs, we source projects well ahead of time, you know, and we pair people with mentors to ensure that they actually talk to people that have these problems, um, you know, take them on ride-alongs, you know, embed them um, in well-established teams. So, you know, I'll just, to give a shout out back to U of I, you know, that was, you know, I was a physics major, you know, nowhere really in IT. Um, or anything like that, but, you know, being armed with analytical thinking, you know, has is, is really been kind of the key thing, you know, that enables you to take, uh, to take your career wherever you want to take it. Yeah, I, I think, obviously, there's a lot of disciplines that get talked about a lot, various emerging disciplines that are, are going to be needed, but I think one thing, and kind of go back to the main theme, is there is a uniqueness to the industry that is different than the video game industry, than is different than even the transportation industry. And so independent of where the individual comes from or independent of the, the discipline that they have, a passion to know and to understand what it is to be a grower, psychologically, financially, emotionally, and, and, and really tailor the products and tailor the, 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 the aspects to that. You know, I, I make the joke, I, I grew up on a quarter acre fescue farm in the suburbs of St. Louis, right? I, I, don't, I don't come from a farm family, but the beautiful part about this industry is the first day in the industry, I was able to just, it was, a, it was arranged, I didn't just pull off on a road, but I'd pull off on the road and sat in the cab of a tractor as we planted corn for eight hours. And I had to pitch a hand every once in a while, but I could just talk and interact. I mean, the, the, the customers are more than willing to educate our employees and educate people that are willing to put in the effort to learn. And so I, I think independent of the background, just the willingness to emerge and immerse yourself in, the, in what this industry is, is a big part of what will become the technologies that lead in the future. Apologies. Try to catch our speakers to talk to them in more detail. We're wrapping up for today. Let's give a big shout out to our panel speakers today. Thank you.